Some of the painting products featured in this video were received free of charge from various companies, however I have not been paid to make this video and all opinions remain my own. The Hawker Hurricane was a World War II fighter aircraft which saw service with many of the Allied forces during the Second World War. Quite notably recognised for its contribution during the Battle of Britain. Hello everyone, I'm Matt, this is Model Minutes and welcome back to the workbench. Today I'm going to show you how I built the Hobby 2000 Hawker Hurricane Mark 1A Late in 170 second scale. So stay tuned because this one gets interesting. For a closer look at the contents of the kit, including the sprues and the other things that are included, take a look at the dedicated unboxing video I made on that topic. In today's video though, I'm going to be focusing on the build and what it looks like in the end. I'll put a list of the products that I used on the screen now to give you an idea of the kind of things that you might want to go and get if you fancy giving this one a go for yourself. Hobby 2000 recommends this kit to those aged 14 and older due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Before I get started though, I actually need to go and get some more paint supplies. So I popped into Froome, which is a little town in Somerset. Quite a picturesque place to visit, but for us modellers there's only really one reason to go here, and that is to visit the Froome Model Centre. I do have a little rule when I pop into a model shop is that I have to buy something no matter how small, to support them. So I actually picked up the Hobby 2000 Hurricane that you see in this video in the shop, which I paid for with my own money. But they did say that I could pick the paints to go with it. So a massive thanks to the Free Model Center for letting me have pretty much everything that I need in order to finish this kit. But without any further ado, let's crack on with the kit. As is quite standard with the majority of my builds, I used my side cutters to snip the parts away from the sprue and on occasion my knife for those very small bits. I then cleaned up any flash or rough parts with a sanding stick. Tamiya Extra Thin Cement will be used throughout this build to glue the parts together. And to start off with I used it to glue the pilot's chair into the bottom of the cockpit assembly. This was then followed by the control column and then the control panel could be glued inside one of the cockpit halves. To paint the interior I'm going to be using this SMS British Interior Green. This is an acrylic lacquer paint which is designed to be put through your airbrush but I can't really be bothered to spray the interior so I'm just going to use a normal paintbrush to see how it is and actually it works out pretty well. It does dry quite quickly and you are pretty much going to ruin your brush by using this paint because you need something a bit stronger than water to clean the lacquer off. Phileo Matte Black was then used to paint the top of the control column, the interior control panel and the external gun sight area on the cockpit. Humble Decal Fix was used to put the control panel transfer into place and then when that was done I glued in the cockpit assembly into its little slot inside the fuselage half. Following this, the two fuselage halves could be joined together, and the alignment is actually quite good. I ran the Tamiya Extra Thin Cement along the seams and then held them in place until the glue had dried. After this, the two halves which make up the nose of the aircraft were joined together, and then this could also be added onto the front of the aircraft. I believe they designed the kit in this way because there are different parts which represent different marks of the Hurricane. Following this, the horizontal tail surfaces were glued into their slots, taking care to ensure they were actually horizontal. And then the upper wing parts could be glued onto the lower wing component. Once that was done, the fuselage could be added to the lower wings, and the fit was surprisingly good. The air intake and radiator that goes on the bottom of the aircraft was assembled and then glued into its slot on the bottom side of the model. This was followed by installing the small air intake towards the front of the model as well. Here I'm cutting off the moulded on tailwheel because it represents the wrong version for the aircraft that I am building. The correct part has been included in the kit and I simply replaced it. 
Now it's time to use some humbral model filler to close up some of the little gaps. There was a noticeable one on the nose of the aircraft, so I filled it in with some of this filler and then left it to dry. Additionally, there are some ejector gun ports on the bottom of the aircraft which need to be filled in as well. This is mentioned in the instructions, and the reason why they're there is because this aircraft actually represents a Mark II Hurricane, which had extra machine guns in the wings, which brought it to a total of 12 machine guns, whereas a Hurricane Mark I only had 8, and these need to be filled in because otherwise it's an incorrect detail. Once that was dry, I then went around and sanded smooth those areas. The kit comes with some pre-cut canopy masks, which is a great addition. They're a little bit fiddly to peel off the backing paper and get perfectly positioned, but they are considerably easier than cutting up your own masking tape. When that was done, some humbral clear fix was applied to the edges of the clear canopy, and then it was glued into place inside the fuselage. This glue should dry clear and strong, and not react with the plastic. I also used this glue to attach the landing light parts which go inside the wings. I don't normally do this until the end of the build, but seeing as there were some masking strips provided for this as well, I thought I might as well do this now before I start painting. And speaking of painting, let's get some on the model. I'm starting off with this Surfacer Grey Lacquer Primer Paint. This should give a nice even finish across the model and provide a good layer for subsequent layers of paint to stick to. Once that was sprayed over the entirety of the model, it was time to move on to the next colour, which is going to be RAF Sky. I always try and work from the lightest colour to the darkest colour because it's much easier to paint a dark colour over a light one. So this was sprayed onto the bottom or the underside of the model and a couple of thin coats would be needed, but I was very impressed with the overall coverage and how quickly these lacquer paints were drying. When that was done I made sure that I had completely masked off the underside in preparation for doing the top camouflage colours. And starting with the lightest of the camouflage colour, it's going to be this one, the Dark Earth. Again, this was loaded into my airbrush and then sprayed over the entire top surface of the aircraft. Again, a couple of thin coats would be needed. Following this, the British green was next to be applied, but I did pop a couple of drops of premium thinner into this just to make it flow a little bit easier and make the drying time a little bit longer. And it was my intention to completely freehand the camouflage on this because I need more practice at freehanding camo. And the reason why I need more practice is because I suck at it, and I think you'll all agree that this kind of sucks. And I was not happy at all with presenting the model like this, so I decided to put the brown back in and spray over my work previously and come up with an alternative solution, which is this. I made some sausages out of some pink tack, and I'm going to fill in the gaps with liquid mask from Vallejo. This latex based paint was applied with a brush to the areas I wanted to keep nice and safe with that brown colour and then the green was sprayed over the top again when everything was dry. And fingers crossed it's worked out. And now for the moment of truth. When everything was completely cured I removed all of the masking tape, those worms and the liquid masking fluid and actually yeah it's done a pretty good job with only a few little areas that needed touching up and that was really easy to do. Now that that's all done it's time to gloss the aircraft ready for application of the decals. A nice glossy surface should prevent them from silvering. And speaking of the decals, I cut the decal sheet into more manageable sections, correctly identifying the right ones for the paint scheme that I was going to do. When I'd done that and was ready to apply them, I dipped them in warm water to release them from the backing paper. For my setting solutions, I'm going to use Microscale Microset in the blue bottle for the first step and Microsol in the red bottle for the second step. And if, like me, you're forever knocking them over, feel free to check the description for a link to where you can download a free file for 3D printing your own Model Minutes stand for these bottles. 
These decals are printed by Cartograph and I absolutely love Cartograph decals. They apply to the model so well and they have excellent printing and registry. I put some micro set down onto the surface of the model to help soften the transfers and make them look like they were paint they were painted onto the aircraft rather than just stickers and then after they were in place and had cured a little bit micro set from the red bottle was brushed over the top to further enhance the effect however there was a small problem with the transfers and i think the best person to talk about that is me but me from the past so building matt here um, I've noticed whilst I've been doing the nose flashes on this uh, Exeter, RAF Exeter aircraft is that Hobby 2000 have given us two which are identical. Now the problem with that is that when you try and put the other one on the other side it doesn't line up, it's not symmetrical. They should be mirrored rather than identical. So that is a problem. So if I, if I line them up up here, because one side's got a high edge and one side's got a like, sorry, one side's got a long edge and one side's got like a short edge. So on this side, you can see that it works. You got the flash going underneath there. But when we turn it around on this side, it doesn't. It, it is in the engine um, exhaust area. So not only that, but if you put it to line it up, well, they just don't, they're short. They're too short. They are too short. So that is an oversight there on the Hobby 2000 guys. Um, yeah, I guess I'll have to come up with a solution. Maybe I'll hand paint that. And come up with a solution I did. I'm going to use this Humbrol 153 enamel, which is insignia red, to paint the band on the nose of the aircraft. Whilst I've got it out, I might as well paint the uh, sort of protective dope that goes over the machine guns as well with it. But anyways, going back to the decals, I decided that I would just cut the sort of V-shapes out of the original transfers and then apply them as best I could in place. It's a little bit annoying because they don't quite match the, the paint colour perfectly, but they are good enough and they are a massive improvement over what was originally provided in the kit. Adapt and overcome, I suppose. The clear gloss makes a reappearance here because it's time to seal in all of those transfers and protect them from any weathering that I might conduct in the next steps. Now it's time to assemble the landing gear legs. The legs were glued onto the doors and then those little struts added. And then I airbrushed pretty much all the remaining details that were still yet to be applied with this aluminium paint. Vallejo Black makes a reappearance here and was used to paint the tyres on the wheels. I'm pretty sure there was a mask included for the wheels, but I thought this would just be easier to paint by hand. Next, I mixed up some gunmetal and gold paints together to try and replicate a sort of exhaust bronze colour for the exhaust on the aircraft. But I wasn't quite happy with that, so I added in a little bit of red to the mix. And the red should make it look a little bit more burnt and rusty. And this was a much better colour choice in the end because it looked a little bit more realistic. Now it's time for the first bit of weathering. I'm using this SMS dark brown wash, which is oil based, and I applied it onto the various parts of the model, which I wanted to look a little bit more dirty. So you can see me here starting off by applying it to the landing gear legs. And then when it had dried a little bit, I used a cotton bud, which had been soaked in some white spirit to carefully remove any excess wash from the areas I wanted to remain a bit more clean. This was then repeated on various areas of the aircraft including the wings the panel lines the engines and some of the other details as well and then once again once that had dried a little bit some cotton bud soaked in white spirit were used to remove the excess from the surface when i'm working on an aircraft i tend to do it in the direction of airflow to try and give a more realistic effect and then once all of that had completely dried it was time to get out some of this flat clear varnish. This was loaded into the airbrush and sprayed over the entire model to bring it back down to a more matte finish. 
the wheels can now be glued onto the landing gear legs and the landing gear glued into position on the bottom of the aircraft. The propeller was assembled and then painted with the matte black we used earlier. And then once that paint was dry, it was time to pick out the very tips of the propeller blades using some Humbrol 24 matte yellow. And then disaster struck. Building mat here again, so I was just uh, fine tuning the pitot tube that goes in that hole there and it's gone. It has pinged off into oblivion and I have absolutely no idea where it is. I've had a good look, uh, but at the moment can't find it. So not sure what I'm going to do about that at the moment. Fortunately, in my stash, I had an Airfix Hawker Hurricane Mark 1, which had a intact pitot tube, but I'm not going to use it, I'm going to effectively copy it. So I took some very quick rough measurements using my calipers and then applied that information to some design software. And after a couple of minutes, I had a design that looked something like this. So I then 3D printed it and an hour later, I had some pitot tube spares and these were then glued into place and a quick paint with some aluminium would help to conceal the fact that I had ever lost one in the first place. No one will ever know. With that other crisis averted, I could move on. The engine exhausts were glued into their slots on the nose of the aircraft. This was then followed by attaching the propeller. The propeller comes with quite a novel solution, to be honest. It's not something I've experienced before to the best of my memory. Basically, the propeller goes onto this arm and then a retaining piece goes on to stop it from falling off. And then the spinner gets glued onto the top of this and it should freely rotate when you've finished it. After this, I could carefully remove the masks on the wings and on the cockpit canopy as well, and they seem to have done a reasonably good job. Now it's time to add some aerial wire to the aircraft. I'm going to use some Ushi Rig That Thing elastic thread. It's probably a little bit thinner than uh, this scale really needs. It should be maybe a little bit thicker, but my process was to apply a little bit of super glue, stretch it over and then let the glue dry and then cut off the excess. When that was done, I'm going to use some of this Humbrol Aging Powders pack. This was a free product that was given to me when I went up to Margate for the Airfits Content Creators Day, and this is the first time that I've used it, so it'll be interesting to see what it's like. Inside the pack, you get a selection of different pots. These are quite small pots, so don't expect loads to be in there, but the powders come in a variety of colors. And if I'm honest, the powder actually goes quite a long way. You only need a tiny tiny amount on your brush when you apply it to your model. So I started off by using the smoke color and you can see inside the pot here that it actually looks pretty good. It's got quite a fine pigment. I normally use pastels and things like that to do my uh, sort of smoke weathering, but let's see how this one goes. So I loaded some onto my brush and then carefully applied it into the areas that I thought would look good. I would use some of the more ready rust color as well to bring out further highlights of color, but having completed this and added some weathering, the aircraft was finally complete. I'm not even sure where to begin with rounding up the review of this kit. It's been such a strange build, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like it. In one hand I've got some really good points and in another hand I've got some really not so good points. So let's try and start off with some of the positive stuff. Looking at the kit, the parts are molded really well and the level of detail on there is quite good. It has been pointed out to me that some of the parts, like particularly the shape around the back of the fuselage where the cockpit is, isn't quite 100% accurate to a real Hurricane, but generally it is quite a good kit to build and you can build it quite quickly and there were no real fit issues. One problem I do have with this kit though is that it's abundantly clear that this was designed or tooled to be a Hurricane Mark II. And the reason why I say that is because you've got all those extra gun ports and things like that, which are details that the Hurricane Mark I didn't have. So having to sort of modify the kit to go backwards a step seems a bit illogical to me. The instructions are printed in colour and that's always great to see as it makes it so much easier to know what you're doing and what things should be painted what colour. Those included masks were pretty good too and I think more kits should have them included in the future. 
It just makes painting things and protecting those clear parts so much easier. The cartograph decals as well, I would love to say they were spot on, but I don't think it's actually cartograph's fault, but the designers of the kit. The decals themselves were beautiful. They were so well printed with good color and registration, but the problem remained with that nose transfer. Had I not done this particular paint scheme, I probably would never have noticed it, but they should have mirrored the transfer rather than just putting in two exact copies. So that is definitely a design fault somewhere. I think this build presented so many challenges that I have sort of managed to overcome, such as those transfers and losing that pitot tube were quite unfortunate. But had a beginner picked up this kit, I'm not entirely sure that they would have been able to rectify the faults that I encountered. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the kit. This kit that I've got here was released by Hobby2000 back in 2020. But it's actually a Hasegawa Rebox and was originally tooled back in 1995. So for a 1995 vintage, it's actually not too bad on the detail front. It kind of does hold a candle to more modern releases like the Airfix Hurricane. But if I'm brutally honest, with the amount of issues that I've encountered today during this build, I would not be inclined to buy a second version. The price on the box when it was in the shop was £17.99, which, if I'm brutally honest, is a little bit cheaper than it seems to be going for in other retailers as it seems to be pushing the more £20 mark in uh, other online shops. And I cannot honestly say that it is worth that much money. Yes, it's got those cartograph decals and it's got reasonably good mould quality and it's even got some masks, but, but when you compare it to the fact that there are other Hurricanes out there which are more modern and you know half the price i can't really justify those little extra bits and pieces pushing the price up so much so whilst i've not had a massively positive experience of the kit itself i can't say the same thing about these sms paints being the first time i've ever tried painting with sms paints or the fact you know that they are acrylic lacquers i have been massively impressed this is definitely a range of paints that i'll look at getting some more in the future once i've got through my backlog of other products i love the fact that these are airbrush ready they dry super quick and they come out of the airbrush without any issues yes they do need a little bit more cleanup due to their lack of nature. But on the whole, this is a product range that I would like to explore a little bit more in the future. Another product worth talking about are those aging powders. So this is the first time I've experienced this product from Humbrol, and I'd like to think that I did an okay job with them, but I still haven't quite figured them out. So the jury is still out on those ones. Maybe with a bit more practice, I'll be able to get better results with them. But anyways, I think it's probably time to wrap this one up here. This has been somewhat of a challenging build, forcing me to find solutions to problems that I probably shouldn't have faced. The kit on the whole isn't too difficult to build, but it does have some issues that I wouldn't expect to see in a kit that was released in the last couple of years. Additionally, it's not really worth the high price point for what you get inside the model. The painting products that I used in this build on the other hand have been absolutely exceptional and are definitely something I would consider using again in the future. What did you think of my build? And do you agree with my review? Do you think my assessment of this kit was fair? Let me know down in the comments. As always, a quick shout out to my patrons and channel members for the extra support they give the channel. Massive thanks to these guys on screen. To find out more about how you can get involved, take a look at the links in the description. Don't forget that down in the description box you'll find a link to the free STL file for one of those micro set and sole holders if you'd like to print one out at home. Whilst you're under the video, dropping a like and subbing to the channel would be greatly appreciated. Further thanks goes to Froome Model Centre for allowing me to test out some of these SMS paints and if you're ever in the area make sure you pop in and see what they've got. Additionally, I'll link their website down below if you would like to take a look at some of their products online. A second thanks to Humbrol for letting us have a go at those aging powders pack. And finally, a massive thank you to you for watching this one, and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.